like to welcome everyone to the September 2021 Community to Community Call hosted by After the Fire. After the Fire, um, we are a nonprofit organization with the mission to help communities navigate recovery and rebuilding and reimagining of their area after wildfire causes so much devastation. Um, we hope that by helping, by being a helper, by being a consultant, by being a networker, and by being a, re being a resource, we can bring practical help and we can also bring hope and um, build resilience because we need to become adaptable communities. We know that fire will be around for a long time and we need to be able to figure out how we live in this situation. And, and, and hopefully, even though fire may come back, let's not have it be so destructive and so disruptive but manage, um, manage to make it through. So that's why we're here to be a mutual help to one another. Um, and so some, you know, we were down, we visit uh, fire regions. Um, first, first thing happened is our organization, you know, we, we came up after the Sonoma County fires and then Lake and Napa as well, the North Bay fires um, of 2017. And then what happened in Paradise um, was only a year after ours and, and Jennifer Gray Thompson went up and helped up there and, and really became um, involved and, and supportive by just sharing some of that know-how. And, um, and now we've been to a lot of other fires too, Woolsey Fire and San, um, we're going to Greenville next week. So let's just put it this way. There's no, no lack of fires for us to um, help. We were down in Santa Cruz because we go back on a regular basis to check in and heard about this issue with um, plumbing and san uh, sewers and, and septic and how um, some of the barriers in the very difficult terrain of Santa, santa Cruz, especially on mountain areas um, and trying to get people back on their land, if we could figure out how to handle this septic slash um, uh, sewer, problem, maybe people get back on their land quicker. And first of all, I wanted to introduce um, some of the people who are wrestling with this problem and brought it to our attention. I'm going to introduce Credence Shaw. Credence Shaw uh, is from Santa Cruz and has been an am amazing volunteer and community organizer, actually was a com uh, volunteer and community organizer before their fires too. So being in that position, he jumped in to help. And I'd like to just spend you know, 10 minutes describing his experience and what he's seeing with this particular issue and how he sought out um, to make some changes there. Credence. Yeah, thank you uh, for the intro. Um, mm -hmm. So kind of where, where I come at it from is the, um, kind of been a volunteer and community member for about 20 years and very involved. The, and a lot of different things. And then um, Community Foundation of Santa Cruz asked me to kind of focus on helping um, the fire community overcome whatever issue came their way. We knew there was gonna be a lot of them. And um, with my background of being a bureaucratic wrangler, um, it kind of is pretty useful there. So one of the early on, one of the things we, we did is we were visiting this community called Last Chance and, and Gina's up there. And they were talking about how after the fire, um, if your septic was ruined, they were gonna make you kind of come up to the current code. And, and what that meant for a lot of people were these enhanced systems. And these enhanced systems for our area are at a minimum $60,000. And so I spent some time with the, the um, our main supplier of those and, and he's even, he, he's basically selling them at what it costs him and it's still $60,000. So they're these hugely expensive systems um, and they're really hard to, in, in some of these rockier, steeper terrains to install. And then um, kind of found that the community was basically using composting toilets anyways. And so the community had already been doing it. So we knew it was already you know, viable. Their, their water, uh, the water quality in that area was you know, testing fine and so, we started pursuing it as a way to have a, um, you know, a lower cost building. So, you know, somebody who had, you know, $100,000 to rebuild, they can't really afford to spend $50,000 on enhanced septic, but they could afford to do, you know, a gray water system and a, a composting toilet. 
So then we started going down the road and, and kind of found our, our county uh, environmental health was, um, she wasn't as opposed to it as everyone kind of made it sound. It's like when I was asking around about it, everyone's like, she's going to say no way. She's going to bite your head off. And I talked with her and while she did bite my head off at first, she kind of came around after a while and um, essentially said, you know, the issue is um, I don't have any codes that allow me to do it. So if you already have a septic system, great, you can use a composting toilet, but we don't have anything that allows me to do it. So you need to go to the state level. And um, so then I started looking into that and ran into Laura Allen, who gave me a, you know, just kind of looking for somebody who had some expertise and called around and talked to some that were a little on the fringe. And then when I talked to Laura, she had really good info and really good, you know, codes and very nice info for me to kind of bring forward. And, so our county is fairly open to it as far as as an option, but the the, the main issue we're running into is uh, state level. We need to kind of advocate for the change, um, and that was really the each house that has you know so much room in it has to have a septic field so big, and so but when you switch to these systems, you have a smaller field and and requirements that work a lot better. So. And then when we started talking about it more, it has so many other implications as far as lower water use. Um, and, and in some of the Central Valley counties, uh, it's a really good option for them uh, for that reason. And, and it just, when things start making sense on a whole bunch of different ways and not just the one way you're trying to get it to work, it's probably a good idea. And so we just kind of kept running with it from there. Yeah, amazing because really what we're seeing so many of these fires are hitting these rural areas who maybe don't have as um, the ability to restore that sewage infrastructure or the money to put in a very expensive, very costly um, uh, septic systems. So thank you for sharing that. And I just wanted to, um, to put it out there that if you would like to ask a question, if you hear something along the way, feel free to put things in the chat as far as questions are concerned. Also, um, uh, if you came in a little bit later, if you're able to put in your name, where you're joining us from, and if you would, if you do so choose to share your contact information there, what we're endeavoring to do is to truly form a network of fire survivors and um, rebuilders so that we can help one another when the time is ready and when the time is right. So um, thank you for joining us, Dave Reed from the planning office at Santa Cruz County and Gina Gensler. Now, Credence, when you were describing the scenario, you mentioned last chance and Gina lives in last chance and I got a chance to meet her in such a beautiful area, but it's definitely a tricky one as far as rebuilding is concerned. And Gina, can you welcome this morning? Can Hi, you morning. please give us, just give us a big picture of who you are and what is last chance? And then what was last chance before the fire? What is last chance facing now? Mm -hmm. the fire? Okay, um, sorry, I'm not trying to be dark face here uh, or whatever. I'm not trying to be obscured. I just can't quite figure out my lighting this morning. Um, so my name is Gina, and my name is Gina Lund. That is my, my name. I, just, I put my maiden name. It's really confusing right now. My kids are making fun of me because I'm, I'm changing scenarios. Um, anyhow, my husband and I um, lived up in Last Chance. Uh, we lived seven miles behind a lock gate up a dirt road. And um, we had a beautiful garden there. I own a store in, in uh, SoCal. Um, I've had it for 10 years now, commute back and forth. Um, but to answer your questions about the um, Last Chance community, we're essentially um, a remote community of people who have little plots of land, who um, we basically are all off the grid, every single one of us. Um, and I would consider us to be a majority of us stewards of the land. You know, we've definitely had to deal with the whole potty talks scenario. I was thinking actually, um, I've been trying to come up with poop puns for the last two days. And I was thinking instead of calling it solving for toilets, we should call it the potty talks. <laughs> <laughs> because every time I start talking to my friends about it, they just feel blank. Oh yeah. And so I, I feel like I have to be entertaining or something like that, anyhow. Um, so I guess, you know, to answer your question without just kind of going on, we basically are a bunch of problem solvers 
who are now stuck with this whole new problem to solve, which is basically, what do we do with our poo? And it's kind of, you know, the answer to just be blunt is probably to do what we've always done, which is to capture it, to keep it safe, to not let it drain out into the world, you know, and to be responsible human beings um, and do things like composting toilets. Um, we usually do a, like a Burma composting toilet, which we found to have like zero odor whatsoever. And basically the work, we can't fill it up fast enough. We can't do the work fast enough to catch up with the worms doing the work fast enough. So anyhow, um, so last chance now is basically, I, I like to refer to our community as a bunch of like hermit crabs or badgers that have been ripped out of our shells and or little homes. And we're all just like, Arr! you know, afterwards, because we're like, we need our protective covering. So um, with all the love and softness inside there, it's just kind of an interesting thing because we are all dealing with this whole debacle of where do we even start, right? And so for us, it's basically the Cal Fire Roads to even find out if we can even rebuild, period. So the septic system is down the road there. Um, and I would say, just like to give a nutshell of what's going on there now, we were basically all, we didn't get the evacuation notice, blah, blah, blah. We all ran for our lives. There's nothing we could do. And um, after the cleanup process, we now have within a stone's throw of our property, we have two septic tanks that are sitting there burnt open. And I, quite a few of you on this call have seen them. They're so wonderful. And now that, um, you know, we have had the, the first cleanup crew, the second cleanup crew, and so now we have these open septic tanks that are just kind of sitting there and we're supposed to deal with them. So, you know, there's been some interesting suggestions from people what we should do, and I have my own ideas about it. But anyhow, um, there's quite a few states that allow it. I think it's worth a conversation and a lot of education for people. If I didn't answer a question, let me know. Cool. Well. Thank you um, for just giving us like a snapshot um, about how many people um, or properties were affected and people or properties that need to figure out what to do next in yeah. less. Specific. I'd say it's about 150 okay. um, properties. And you know, we, we don't have, we have phone lines only, which is gonna be a really interesting thing because I've heard from different people. I wear my store is, it's like a little corner store and I get all the info. I, I've been called the Oracle before because it's just like the most random things come through like the Comcast got that the fact that they used to hook up and they are going to again, hook up generators to the PG line, keep Comcast going. But um, anyhow, I heard down, what was I gonna say? Well, we were just wondering how many right. were having to make those decisions and and you- uh, had I just totally brain part, part, farted. Part yeah, you as the local store owner are like a hub for information. So it's like, uh, ah, just left my mind. I'm so sorry. I'll have to think about it for one second. I'll get back to that. But basically, it's you know the thing is is it's just it's yeah it's little bits and pieces. Well, the, I'll, I'll be back with that in a second. Pardon me. Yeah, well, um, and 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 we're on here with people from Oregon and California, and Oregon has different codes uh, and different rules about this than California does. Um, California is quite strict. Dave Reed, can you um, tell us from your perspective, uh, introduce yourself to the group and then tell us from your perspective what you're seeing requested of you and or what you think might be an opportunity for some, some new solutions. Sure, good morning everybody. Sorry I was a little bit late. Um, my name is Dave Reed. I'm with the County of Santa Cruz Office of Response, Recovery and Resilience. So we, um, it's a new office at the county um, supporting fire recovery, climate change resilience, and our um, emergency operations and emergency response efforts at the county um, in, in disaster. Um, and as Gina and Credence articulated, you know, working within the existing state regulatory framework um, and introducing innovative low water uh, personal sanitation systems is is challenging. Um, you know, every every level of government you go up um, from the local government when you get to the state and then the federal right. The the, the the common practice is it's a one size fits all solution from a regulatory standpoint, and um, and you know making it as blanket and uniform everywhere makes it easier for the higher levels of government to regulate. And the purpose of that is, is well-intentioned in the sense of water quality, protecting water quality 
um, surface water quality, groundwater quality, um, when you're dealing with sanitation and, and pathogens um, is important, right? That I'm not questioning that, that component of it. Um, but, but what the current regulatory framework requires is essentially an entirely functioning conventional septic system. And then you can throw on top of that your composting toilet. And the idea is, you know, you, um, Gina or, or anyone else on the call might love managing a composting toilet and, or you might love doing it for three years. And then you decide I'm tired of this and I don't want to do it. And then what do you do? Um, and I think we have examples in, in our regulatory framework where we can monitor things year over year. And if you're a good good actor and it's going well, then you can continue to do that. If you decide to do something different, then you have to install something different. Um, I have an outdoor shower that gray waters the outdoor, the water from the shower. I love showering outdoors all year round. A lot of people would think I'm crazy, right? And so I, I think, um, you know, there are some people who think managing a composting toilet is crazy, but there are also new technologies where it's you know, it's an incinolet where it just incinerates the stuff and you get some ash and you're not dealing with the complexities of a conventional composting toilet. So I think, but, but the problem, right, is that the one size fits all at the regional water board level and at the state level, as Credence may be alluded to, or, or but he has investigated, makes it really hard for us to reduce the costs to rebuild after disaster, implementing some of these technologies. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, if you're using a low water system, do you need a leach field? Well, um, you probably still need some sort of leaching system for the black water from a kitchen sink. But in theory, our state codes right now may allow you to gray water almost everything else if your toilet, if you figured out something different for your toilet. So could you, could you have a septic tank as a backup? Um, and less leach fields, because the leach fields themselves, just to get into the weeds, is one of the complicating factors when you have shallow groundwater. And so if you do have shallow groundwater, the Regional Water Quality Control Board has strict requirements on the separation between the shallow groundwater and your in the bottom of your leach field. And particularly, not so much in Last Chance, but in other parts of our community and other parts of the state, I'm sure, um, the, the separation does not meet the regional water quality control board standards between groundwater and the bottom of the of the leach field and so you have to do an alternative treatment septic system and i actually have one at my house it's got a little computer attached to it it's got microbes digesting stuff and then it and then i have a drip emitting field basically that emit that drip emits all of the water the black water underground but at like 18 inches underground but those systems cost anywhere between sixty and a hundred thousand dollars for the permits, design, and construction of those things. And as Gina can attest, that's not Gina, difficult for a rebuilder. Yeah, that's very difficult for a rebuilder, right? I did it um, and choked down that cost um, when I did it, but that was ten years ago, and it was cheaper. And you know, um, and I wasn't going through the the traumatic experience of our fire families. So, what what what? What Credence and I have envisioned, right, is that we're a state that has water problems, right? That's not going away. That's only getting worse. So how do we how do we approach the state regulatory framework under the under multiple lenses, right? The fire recovery support lens of providing alternate system of it capacity, the water the water consumption lens. How do we how do we start to shift that narrative so that we could come up with reasonable um, alternatives to this this current framework where you have to have a fully functioning septic system and then you can layer on top because work we are quote unquote worried about the next owner well the next owner wants to buy that house and they don't want to worry about a composting toilet then they pay the money to install yeah. it or the market drives the cost of that the property value of that home down a little bit because that next property owner has to install that system. Right. Um, but but I think those that in my opinion, and I'm not a state regulator, 
Um, and there may be some who feel differently, but I, I feel like that's not, that shouldn't be the only rate limiting step. Like if, if we're concerned about the next property owner or we're concerned about somebody getting tired three, five, 10 years down the line of maintaining it, then let's have an annual maintenance review process. And if those people get tired, then they have to fix the problem to make sure we keep their environment safe, the groundwater around their home safe and everything else. Like I think we can, we can figure out a way to do that, um, at least in my mind. Awesome. Well, there there's are a lift there for sure. There's a, you know, there's a, there's a political and, and regulatory lift that, you know, yeah. little Santa Cruz County has a hard time doing on our own. Sure. Well, and this is one of the things when we talked to you, Dave, and we talked to Gina and we were hearing about these issues and this is the kind of thing our organization would like to help with because not only to help you guys, which is really important to us, but we see this as potentially helping a lot of other communities as well. And there has been attention on toilets internationally, on thinking differently about toilets. This is old technology that we use. And believe it or not, it's even been showing up in the late night comedy shows. It's been showing up on The Daily Show. And seriously, just this week on Samantha B about sewers overflowing out east um, and, and holy crap, <laughs> going into people's backyards uh, and not being, um, contained uh, safely. And so with disaster, with water shortages, just like you said, with the financial stresses that people are enduring with insurance being an issue, all these different things, I think it's a, a, a moment in time where potentially we could work together to, to raise this up. I would like to introduce Laura Allen. Laura Allen is co-founder of Gray Water Action. She's been working on um, these gray water, uh, black water, uh, not just toilets, but all kinds of home, um, uh, home alternative solutions and knows not only about um, the issue, but she knows about the standards and she knows about the different states um, that have adopted these things or not and why. And um, I've asked her to come in here and just really educate us about the lay of the land and what she knows. I would love to hear what she knows about those states that like Oregon is more open to this versus California, which is not. And um, what, what could help us uh, bring in more options for these rebuilders? Laura, Laura Allen, thank you for joining us. Um, yeah, thanks for having me. I have a, a short presentation. I don't know if it's helpful. I wasn't sure like the knowledge level of the group and do you think it'd be helpful just to kind of get us on the same page or should I just talk? I think it would be good. I mean, I was kind of hoping you would give us a little background, just an education piece and, and let me know if you have any issues sharing your slides. I think it should be allowing you to. Yeah. It's started. Okay, good. We want to learn. Great. So it, it's a short presentation, um, but so my background, I've had a composting toilet in my home for, I don't know, 15 years or so in, in California, um, in several places uh, where I've lived in California. I've lived in the Bay Area and Los Angeles area. And now I live in Oregon, I'm in Eugene. And it's always been supplemental to also having existing you know, sewer system. So there is this tension between, you know, it being allowed, like in California, in many places, it's not disallowed, it's just not allowed to be your primary source of sanitation. So there's lots of people using composting toilets all over California, and communities have allowed it, counties have, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but so I have personal experience, and then I also work on policy. I'm a technical committee member for IATMO, it's the, they write the uniform plumbing code, they have a green code called water efficiency standard. So I'm on that committee and there is a composting toilet chapter and I'll talk about that um, a bit later. And so I'm definitely involved in the policy as well as kind of the practical um, nature of it. And our organization, Gray Water Action, we're an education organization. And so we work with people that wanna do these systems. We mostly do gray water, which is you know more attractive to more people, especially during drought times, but also composting toilets and try to help make sure that people have the information they need to do these things safely and successfully. Um, so uh, Credence already talked a bit about, you know, the benefits of composting toilets, about the water savings and energy savings. Uh, there's a lot of benefits and just to briefly orient us to how they work, it's just nature. You have organic material, 
it composts. And so when you're talking about human feces, the difference is you need to make sure that that composting process happens in isolation because if somebody had a fecal transmitted disease, that would be in the material. So if someone contacted it or if there was a vector, flies, rodents, uh, rain, water moving material away, any type of movement where there could be contact, that's how diseases can be um, transmitted. Um, keeping water out of the equation is so much safer than managing black water because you know water moves, it soaks into the ground, it gets into the groundwater, someone has a well. There's just a lot more potential for contamination when you have water involved. So composting toilets kind of are inherently, I would, I would say they're inherently safer because you're not mixing water in. Um, they do have to be done where in an isolated uh, contained location and making sure that either the material gets really hot you know, the microorganisms heat up the material and that kills off pathogens. So it either has to get really hot for a short amount of time or it, take, or it takes a long time. Because pathogens that live in the human body, they can't live well outside the body for the most part. And so over time, they'll die off. So that's how any composting toilet works. It's just creating the conditions, favorable conditions for composting and making sure it happens in isolation. And so a composting toilet, just really briefly, it's a couple of parts. It's what you sit on. That's kind of what we think of as a toilet. But then there's also a collection chamber or a receptacle. Some of these toilets are just temporarily collecting the material in a small container, and then it's being moved to where it actually composts over time, because it can take a, a, up to a year, up to two years to compost. Um, so there's a location. It could be under the toilet. There's some very large composting toilets where everything happens usually below the building. Um, so that could be an option in a rebuild, though, of course, those big ones are not, not cheap. The smaller ones are where you're composting outside in a dedicated area. And then there's a management plan. So it is different. You have to, you don't get to flush and forget with the composting toilet. There is some kind of management. Um, there are some limited examples of uh, a city government being responsible for the management plan, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But typically, the management falls onto the homeowner. So they are responsible for their compost. Um, for like emergency situations, this can be a great option. You can quickly get some buckets, some sawdust, some of these snap on lids, people can have somewhere to go. So they can be really adaptable from the really super quick, cheap option to um, a system that is installed in buildings. There's many examples in big buildings, commercial scale, um, office buildings public restrooms uh, where they have these micro flush toilets or a foam flush toilet that uses a little bit of material and it can move the poop and toilet paper down to a large compost chamber. So there are kind of more, um, they can look similar to a regular flush toilet, but these again are gonna cost more. So what people typically do is they have a smaller system, like a self-contained little composting toilet. This one is a very common um, one that you'll see in cabins and um, kind of seasonal usage it's small so it doesn't require the composting to happen somewhere else but it's easy to install and it's not too expensive and then there's bigger ones um, and then their systems are called batch systems where you're collecting the material in like a wheelie bin and then you can move it away and put another one in and that's really good if you don't know how many people are going to be using the toilet or how quickly it will fill up you can make sure that there's enough capacity to handle whatever uh, comes into that toilet um, sometimes these toilets divert urine, so I don't know if you've heard about that. Urine is a great fertilizer. It doesn't contain all the pathogens that feces could contain, so there's a lot of advantages to remove it from the composting process. Um, it also contains most of the nutrients, so in places that have a lot of nutrient contamination issues, getting the urine out can be a benefit, so you'll see people interested in that, and it's kind of the same idea. It just removes most of the liquid. Um, these can be home-built. This was in my apartment when I lived in Los Angeles, uh, very small. I took out the flush toilet, kept it, uh, so I put it back in when I left. This was an eco-village, so there was support from the community, and we had outside area to compost. But basically, it's just a little toilet that's covering up a bucket, a glorified bucket, adds sawdust, uh, there's no odor. Um, you do the composting outside, so you can manage it, a lot of capacity. And this can work in pretty much any situation that has a place to compost. You can buy these. Um, then there's the ones that you purchase. Sunmar is a brand that's pretty popular. Um, and I'm going to skip these just to orient us. Um, and there's, of course, like factors going into what's going to be the right toilet for the person that uh, people need to think about if they're going to use a composting toilet. 
And so I wanted to share this example. There's not a lot in the US of municipal support for composting toilets, but this is in the city of Syracuse in New York. There is a community that lives right on top of the lake that supplies the drinking water. And so from the early 1900s, the city has been involved in the sanitation of this community. I think it's mostly vacation homes, but there is still a lot of people coming here and they have to poop somewhere. And so they don't want that going into the city's drinking water. So for about a hundred years, they actually had a collection system where they would go and collect the pails of these homes and remove them once a week. And that got to be too expensive. So it wasn't until the late 1990s where they, they changed that and they supported these um, houses that were right on the lake that had really unsuitable sites. There's like no way a septic would work. Um, no room for advanced septic. They really didn't have options other than not going there. So they supported them to put in composting toilets and they paid for them, they monitor them, and they do still collect the material. So they require the residents to move the material out of their small composting toilets into an outdoor container and then the city comes and in the spring takes it off and composts it in a municipal scale. Um, environment where they can monitor it and make sure it gets hot enough and there's no pathogens. So it's a lot less expensive for the city because they're only collecting once a year now, I believe, um, but they still are actively supporting and managing this community's waste because they don't have other options. So um, it's a possibility, you know, it's not, it's very uncommon, but it definitely is a possibility if a county community really wants to um, do this. And so I want to just briefly talk about the regulations. So in California, we have the state plumbing code, and it doesn't prohibit composting toilets. It, there's no, nothing in the code that says you can't do this. Um, but what was, was spoken to before, you do have to have you know, sanitation option to have a, a, dwelling, a dwelling to be habitable. And so you, that could easily be interpreted as you have to have a flush toilet connected to a sewer or septic. And typically that's, a, that's spelled out in local ordinances or county codes, but the state code has allowances for alternate methods and materials to, so long as they're safe. And so in theory, a county could, they would have to take a political leap and they'd have to be pressured because you know counties are risk adverse and they don't wanna do things that are, could potentially open up to lawsuits or no one wants to be first in these kind of things. It's not seen as a good thing, but a county could in their own code say, yes, you can do this in a refire rebuild. And the pl state plumbing code is not prohibiting that. Um, it would be great if the state plumbing code explicitly allowed it, which it doesn't. Um, and I'll talk about just in a sec, some ideas for that. But a county definitely could do it on their own if they wanted to. Local ordinance, their local area management plan, um, it's not prohibited. I found two counties that have favorable regulations just to share Humboldt County, they did some work. So they have some very rural communities that they know they use composting toilets. They know they use gray water. It's kind of, um, you know, people that have a lot of resistance to um, complying with codes. And so they were, the county was really trying to work with this community and make it possible for them to legalize their dwellings. And so, what they did is they allowed composting toilets explicitly in this county in certain conditions, like this is owner occupied single family. And they had they have several exemptions. And one of them is number two that I highlighted. The site on which the waterless toilet is proposed has, I can't actually read all this because these were pictures are in the way, but basically it's not, they have a failing septic and it's not feasible due to local conditions. So they kind of went out on a limb a little bit and made an allowance saying that these homes, they're they have a failing septic, that's a, that's a problem. We can allow them to fix that problem by having a composting toilet. Uh, so it's different than allowing a new home to be built, but they have said you can do this. So that's something to look to. And then Nevada County, I was just kind of looking online at these different county regulations and they had an exemption where I was like, wow, are they actually allowing homes to be built with no sewer? Because it really sounds like they are. Um, they're saying that waterless toilets are allowed. Um, you have to have all this plumbing to do your regular, um, you know, other stuff, except if you're a limited density owner built rural dwellings. So when I read that, I thought, wow, maybe this really is allowing these buildings to be built without the conventional system. But when I emailed them and asked, like, is that what you mean by this? They said, well, we actually wouldn't let that happen. So um, you can read the quote from the email um, on the screen. So basically, you know, a county could, they could say, we are making this exemption and we do mean it for fire rebuild only, for example. Yeah. 
That is, I mean, even just to start, uh, a lot of times we've had we've had emergency ordinances for for our rebuilds here where we can say in this case we can do something a little bit different and maybe that's where we start yeah and just i have one more um just one more thing so oregon does allow composting toilets but you do have to have your septic your legal septic so that doesn't really help people who are trying to rebuild when septics aren't going to work mm -hmm. um so i just want to end just to share with you the standards that are applying here that counties can look to. So there's a product standard, which is certifying a specific thing. So these are manufactured composting toilets and the product standard that applies is the NSF 41. And so they have to, these companies um, pay to have their product tested independent, you know, third party tested and making sure that they work, don't have offensive odors, the material in the end is safe. And there's two companies that have done that for the US market. It's Clevis Multrim and Sunmar and they have multiple products under that. So some places that do allow composting toilets as a secondary toilet or maybe a cabin, like not you know, seasonal dwelling, they require NSF 41. So that's um, not prohibited. Then there's another standard um, and standards are different. Standards are like a lot, all of the rules and all the ways you'd have to install it. And they basically, if a county adopts a standard or a state adopts a standard, now it's a code. So you can kind of think of a standard like a code, except the standard, the water efficiency standard is not adopted by anywhere to my knowledge in California or Oregon, but it could be. It's published by the same people that write the uniform plumbing code. It's you know, very reputable. It goes through this whole consensus process with industry and regulators and all that. So it's a standard that could be adopted by a county um, and used, and it has a chapter on composting toilets. So that's something that can, can help, I think, if a county wants to go out on a limb, I'll say, and they could look to this as something to follow since the state code doesn't have anything. Um, and just to end with kind of when I was thinking in my mind, like, what could we do? There is a state code that would be great because it would help a lot of communities. It's on a triennial adoption cycle. So that means it takes three years for a change to happen. But there have been times when they've gotten off the code cycle and they've done an emergency adoption. Um, they did that for gray water. The first time California really legalized simple gray water, it was done through this emergency situation because of a drought, because there was political support and pressure, they will come out of their cycle. So if there was a lot of pressure on Sacramento, um, it's through the Department of Housing and Community Development, if they were getting a lot of pressure um, around this issue, they could come out of their cycle and do emergency measures. So it's possible. You know, would they do that? I have no idea, but it's possible. And then there's again the local um, county wide, county by county potential amendment. Mm -hmm. So cool. I'll just stop there and see if you have questions or other ideas about what to yeah. do. Well, you know, I heard from Dave Reed in the chat that he has to leave at 11. And so I would love to, if you're still there, Dave, and haven't had to pop off yet, um, any responses to what we're hearing from Laura Allen from your perspective? Um, I mean, I think just from an explanation standpoint, and maybe Laura, you know this um, already, but for, for others, the way that the system works for California is really the Regional Water Quality Control Board, which there are a number of regions, regulates what's called the Local Area Management Plan, which is the county's management plan for on-site water, wastewater treatment systems, that's the OWTS. And their standard of practice, just factually, whether I agree or not, is not as and critical in this moment, but their standard of practice is they want some uniformity within their region with those local area management plans and to ensure that the standards required in their entire region are relatively consistent. So. Santa Cruz County is, is one of the last counties to be getting our local area management plan adopted and approved. That's gonna happen next month. Um, and then we're kind of locked in. Um, that was a two year process to get that local area management plan approved. And, and there were many conversations and negotiations with the Regional Water Quality Control Board. So it's harder at a county level to do something that's different than the region. And that's where I'm thinking at the region and state level, we need to be having this conversation to push it down from that level 
so that it becomes a tool in the toolbox that the region can use and then the individual counties can evaluate and apply. So at least that's conceptually how I'm thinking about it. Like we're not at this county level gonna be able to introduce and implement the tool um, for the toolbox. And, you know, and, and it's just figuring out how we get it to push down as an available resource for people to consider. And again, I think the application of it, as you said, Laura, like for people who want to do it and Gina and others, right, for people who want to do it and people who like me who like to shower outside, it's a non-issue, right? We're happy to do those things. And we just need to be able to get that tool in the toolbox. And I think the best, the way that I'm conceptualizing, right, is that it's it's got to be state level down. Yeah. And, and it seems to me that it doesn't have to only be those people who want to live off the grid, but it could be because I know how it is. It's a very, very expensive in this moment and time to try to build a house. I mean, cost of materials have gone through the roof. There's only limited, maybe people had very inadequate insurance. Now it's even hard to reinsure your home. So you do some things incrementally. I know in my neighborhood, which is a suburban neighborhood, people are like, I'm going to get back in my house, but I can't do any landscaping and it may be three years before I can afford to do it. Maybe this is what you do for a while and maybe later you decide to do a more extensive uh, septic system when you can afford to do it. And that's what I'm kind of wondering too. Does that make sense? Like trying to manage costs, what you can do, what you can't do. But then if this is also a way to truly be proactive on water saving, because Drought is a major, major problem. Anybody else on, on this call um, active in, in water, water saving and water management? Um, any thoughts about how this impacts our water supply? I just wanted to say one thing about the whole, just the regulations and having it be so stringent. I think one of the most, um, pertinent arguments to really work on this is because if people have, keep getting told no, they're just going to do it anyways. You know what I mean? And I'm not trying to, it's just the reality of how things work. And I know it's kind of a different topic, but one of the things that we were all dealing with like pre-pandemic and still now is the fact that when you walk around in cities, one of the big issues is hep A because there's human feces everywhere. Yeah. It's a public so health. It's like, I think that we ha there has it has to be more important. And I think really the most important thing is to educate about what is human poop. It's not some like horrible radiative thing that nobody can deal with. It's actually considered historically like a valuable resource. And if we look at it that way and we really start to re-educate that maybe, you know, and I understand that people want this blank system, but we live in Santa Cruz County alone. How many micro microclimates do we have? And we have some of the steepest mountains in the nation due to the uplifting of the geological blah, blah, blah. And I just really, you know, like in China and places like that, they call it night soil. Mm. And I just, the article I put is about people in Japan fighting over poo. I mean, here we are. And like, yeah, it's just it's so much, it's wasted waste. Yeah. yeah. That's, can we have some more regenerative systems? For sure. And I think that really it has to, it really just has to be like a redial of how we look at what we're dealing with. It's not some, yes, poop has things that can make us sick, but so do lots of other things. Can make us just as sick, like pesticides, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, I, not to put you on the spot, but Kevin Dial is on the line and Kevin is from the LTRG up in, um, up in Santium Canyon in Oregon. And um, thank you for being here. And I'm wondering if you can, if you have, you know, I only got to know you just recently. So you can say, sorry, don't know about that. But can, what do you know about how this is working in Oregon? So like you said, this is day five for me as recovery yeah. manager in Santium Canyon. Um, what I know that is occurring up in the canyon right now is that the code does not allow for rebuild some of the houses that even existed prior to the fire can't be rebuilt back on the property that they came from because of land allowances and code changes over time where uh, river zones extended so now you're inside of a, a, a riparian area or a boundary of water so properties that had pre-existing um, 
bleach fields are no longer now eligible to be rebuilt. So these kind of issues with uh, composting or incinerative or uh, some other way to deal with that waste are going to be about the only viable option to meet code and still rebuild in those places. And that, that's about the sum total of what, what I've uh, gotten the first five days. Great. Well, I would like to continue looking into this and seeing, you know, that's devastating to realize that you lived somewhere, it burned down, and now you can't live there again. And right. it's just, a, it's, it's horrible. So, um, Mary, you had a question. No, not a question. I'm, I work for the DEQ, so, um, Oregon DEQ, that is. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, you guys are doing a great job, you know, I mean, it is, it all is about controlling the pathogens, right, and making sure that, you know, we, you know, I'm, I'm great that you talked about, you know, making sure you don't get rainwater getting on and moving poop out, you know, because then, you know, you don't want people to get sick. Um, it is true that, um, you know, if people have an on-site system, they need a certain amount of space for that, and some of the um, uh, lots, especially like in gates, are just too small, and, they, you know, for them to rebuild, they would have to get more land. And, um, you know, they are looking at a, a two big community systems, but they're very, very expensive. So I really appreciate the opportunity to learn about maybe some of these options. Um, again, it's going to be acceptability to people. I mean, it's, it's, it's so much easier, maybe wrong, you know, just to flush and go and forget about it. So in, in that sense, I totally get, you know, to get people on board that, hey, you can't just flush and go, you might have to do some maintenance, that whole maintenance plan. But that doesn't mean that there wouldn't be some people open to that um, if, if that made their home more affordable. Um, but I, I did see that the rule said that, you know, you also have to have availability at uh, another system. Again, I think we're thinking, hey, if something goes wrong, you, you, you want people to have a place to put their, their, their poop because we are concerned about those pathogens, right? Yeah. Any ideas, Laura, from from what you're hearing here? Um, I mean, I wonder, you know, this would be completely new in the West. Like, could there be funding to collect materials so people don't really have to compost on state? That could alleviate a lot of concerns from the DEQ, environmental health, you know, all the regulatory agencies, because they're going to compost in a commercial, you know, compost facility, the material, and people would just need to put it in a they could drop off bins, kind of like trash collection service, but a it little It's bit. like recycling. It yeah. was, it was to recycle another byproduct of something. And this time it's poop. Yeah, I mean, could that work here? Well, I mean, I think, I think you know, anything like that, you know, we probably would need a pilot study, right? To demonstrate how that would work. Of course, we have composting rules in Oregon. So how are you going to meet those? which again, you know, we're composting sludge. So, you know, we have, we have knowledge that how we can do some of these things, but yeah, I think, you know, to, sh to have a demonstration project would be huge to show how this could work for a certain amount of homes and then how would you scale it up, right? Um, Cause it is gonna become a cost thing, right? We all know that having a traditional onsite system or a community, like a mechanical plant is very expensive, right? Right. What about the idea of having a, a university or somebody like that take it on as a as a pilot prop, you know, and have it be that way it would just be starting back. And I just have to say, the tone of of um kind of stop around the reg. I, I hear it hundred percent, but I feel like we just kind of need to open up and embrace the poo. I feel like Mr. Hankey should be our, our sponsor because it is really just a resource that is so good. And I hear what you're saying, the pathogens and all of that stuff, but I feel like it's a relativity issue. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, it's just kind of like hyper-focusing on this one thing. And yes, I still hear it. I just, you know, I, I don't work in the public sector and all of that, but um, I, I think that there would be, you see, and I, I remember what I was going to say. I can't believe I almost forgot, but um, that supposedly, it's kind of off the poo topic, but supposedly in the burnout communities, um, they don't have technicians who know how to replace the phone lines physically. They actually don't know how. And I, I feel like that's kind of a silly answer, but anyhow, just side nugget, sorry. Um, the other thing I would say before I have to depart, um, and I apologize, uh, is 
the the alt treatment system industry is a model in which I think we can look at as a rep as trying to replicate into this space in the sense that there are there is a regulatory and oversight requirement for people who install these alt treatment systems, the advanced treatment systems, and Santa Cruz County is an example, you're required to maintain that system. So that, that service provider comes out once or twice a year, make sure everything is operating appropriately. That provides the, the peace of mind to the regulatory industry and to the, the, the municipality that that system is operating appropriately. To me, we just create that system with composting toilets. So if you choose to have a composting toilet, you agree that some third party verification person is gonna come out annually and make sure everything is operating appropriately. Um, and I think that kind of licensed professional gives peace of mind to the jurisdiction that things are being operated appropriately. And so I think that's another way in which we can try and take that that new system example and, and, and bring in composting toilets into that conversation. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, I see um, um, in the comments here, my next door neighbor on the Mackenzie is a chemist working with a startup corporation that works on the basis of collecting poo and processing it. Very interesting. I do not understand the chemical process. My neighbor did express interest in a demonstration site on the Mackenzie in the area of Blue River that was destroyed by the Holiday Farm Fire. But I think he may have given up on it by now. Maybe not time to give up on it, but revisit it, who knows? Um, I'm very interested in knowing who wants to follow this to the next stage and, and definitely let me know because we may hold some more meetings on, on what, what's possible and, and where we can maybe look for a pilot or help support that so that we can actually do something with this rather than just talk about poop for, cause it's fun to talk about poop. But I, I, I feel like let's see what's possible. Yeah, public education, definitely. You know, I, we were just jet laughing about after the fire and Dave, thank you so much for being here. I realize your plate is very full and you have to leave early but um, I appreciate your participation and we'll stay in touch. Um, uh, it's, it's fine. Those of us who work with After the Fire, many of us have a background a while ago, we were all teachers. So we think learning <laughs> is a lifelong endeavor. And um, these challenges are only opportunities to learn and, and, and open our minds to like, it's business as usual doesn't seem to work anymore. And we need to find ways to, um, to solve problems so that we can come back better, hopefully, you know. Jennifer um, Gray Thompson, did you have anything you wanted to add um, from after the fire? Uh, no, thank you so much. All of you are doing, all of you are very busy. You're all in fire affected areas and that you would take your time to spend this time with us. We really appreciate it. And I love, you know, there's a lot of people here I've grown very fond of, you know exactly who you are. Um, I'm really, uh, thank you for looking at this problem in a way that helps us reimagine what's possible because that's our, that's our deal is we will not be stuck in the despair of this problem. That we that, that, that there's time for that and then there's a time for moving forward together and, and really solving these complex issues in a way that is um, relevant to your actual lives and your rebuilding and not just up in the pie yeah. in the sky. So thank you so much. And thank you. So one last thing, if you have not put in your contact information in the chat, I would really appreciate that because I will follow up with whoever is interested and um, we'll figure out what some next steps can be. Stay in touch with me, Kevin Dial, with your LTRG work. And if there's something that's going on there in, in your fire region to maybe try something out, they're doing some really innovative stuff with building cabins and building tiny homes and housing people for the, the short, but seems like too long term of interim until their homes are rebuilt. And we all know that takes a while. Catherine Wilson, did you have a question? Oh, Dave, Kevin, were you gonna say something? We had a, a community meeting last night at the city of Gates. And again, as you look at a small town community not being able to build a full water treatment facility, it might be a shared because there are joint communities up and down the canyon. So again, looking at other alternatives that could possibly, again, not one camp community or one small town town trying to absorb that whole cost so yeah. that was another kind of solution that came up at their visioning meeting last night so cool. all right 
Awesome. And I think you have another meeting like that tonight too, don't you? With Detroit, correct. Yeah, okay, cool, nice. Um, Catherine Wilson. Yeah, I'm in Santa Cruz County. I lost two houses, which means <coughs> I lost my primary source of income. I'm sorry. And, uh, vastly underinsured like everyone else. And we're running into a number of issues here that um, will probably have to be solved at the state level um, because you know the county by county, every county is different. And there is no reason why if the governor can, can't say, you know, this is an emergency, these fire victims, they have nowhere to go, their insurance is gone. Uh, we have to have, you know, emergency procedures to do this, and it would involve uh, geological studies, septic uh, issues, and so on. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to see a group like this, because I think we do have to do something statewide, and uh, possibly nationally, or at least uh, the three states on the West Coast, uh, because we're facing ongoing fires, and this community is only going to grow. So I'm, I'm just putting that out there. Let us not forget that uh, the governor and the, legis the state legislature have the ultimate say so on how we, we treat fire victims. Yeah, thank you for sharing, Catherine. I'm sorry for your loss. Which area of Santa Cruz were your, um, did you lose your homes? I'm in the San Lorenzo Valley in Boulder Creek. In Boulder Creek, okay, yeah. yeah. Long Catherine, road. we'd actually just like to have a, a side conversation with you, if we could, because um, we, you know, we've certainly been to Boulder Creek many times, but we always want to hear another experience of what's going on. And I also want to let you know that we've been doing federal advocacy for almost four years, and we are certainly we do state advocacy, and and the only, and we don't make up, you know, out of our heads what it is we should be talking about. We learn from fire mm -hmm. survivors and from our own experience. Um, what isn't working? And a lot of it isn't working. A lot yeah, of, some it, of isn't it is working. working. But yeah. let's let's um, let's connect with Catherine um, aside from this conversation so we can. Okay, I, I, I put my email address in the chat. Yep, we got it there. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Laura, you wanted to share. Um, yeah, it was just uh, a suggestion that maybe we could draft a letter to state of California for the plumbing code to make some kind of amendment and we got the language right and everyone signed on and we I've worked on these code rewrite processes for I don't know, several cycles so we could try to get you know get it as good as we can and then apply political pressure to make it happen sooner rather than later but I'd be happy to help with that I like I like the way you're thinking I think that's what we need to do and and but we need you because you you are 360 you understand these issues so thank you so much for being part of that and then we can help deliver it to the right people's desks. And I think that's part of what we're able to do, right, Jennifer? We will leverage whatever we have in the way of influence and connections um, in service to fire survivors and rebuilding. We'll put it on our on our letterhead, which is full of fancier people than I am for sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, we will we know we have a good relationship with the state senators, a good relationship with the people mm -hmm. and the levers. We are not, we're not magical. We are only uh, driven by the power of the people who we are with. So we love that kind of idea. We are mm -hmm. all in. But you know, um, I think as we work with things on a more national level, like listening to um, Fannie Mae and FEMA and these, these people who are really deeply involved in getting people rebuilt, we can raise up the need for some alternatives and to maybe find funding for this kind of thing for fire um, hit communities. And that, honestly, they may not have even occurred to them. So honestly, if we can just make this part of the dialogue that can help as well. Yeah. So I, want, I just wanna thank all of you. Um, let me check the chat to see if there's others. We've got the contact information for the chemists working on poop. I'm really happy about that. Gina recommended connecting with Paradise. We definitely will. Um, we have people, from, uh, gentleman Charles Brooks on our staff. Um, our COO is a paradise mover and rebuilder and shaker. So he, he can definitely help with that. Um, and yeah, they had just had a landmark of having a thousand houses rebuilt, but that means is that one tenth of what needs to be rebuilt? It's still a long road ahead. They yeah. had 
27,000 structures. 27. So I just asked yeah. Charles because I saw Gina's comment. Yeah. He actually has a program that helps people replace their, their sewers, their septic, sorry. Uh, the entire town of Paradise was on, sept was on septic before. Now the business core um, has a plan ah. to replace that with sewer. They had their the process of uh, EIR stage. And, but they do have a lot of failing septic systems that need to be replaced. Mm -hmm. So we're also happy to get you more information or connect any of you directly. We are not possessive of our relationships with anybody in any fire affected community. For the record, you want to talk to somebody directly, you let us know. We will set that up for you. Um, so we're happy, Gina, to get more information or if you want, if you want a direct connection with Charles, you got it. Okay. okay. All right. Um, I just want to thank you all for being here. What we do is we, as you know, we've re, we've recorded this, and we have a YouTube channel um, that we put all the recordings of these. We have them on different topics. We also, you know, we haven't picked next month's topic because we're still talking with communities and we're trying to figure out what's the latest thing folks are wrestling with. So if if you ever have a suggestion for a topic that you hope we can bring folks together to discuss. Just send me a message, you know, and we'll and we'll try to make that possible. Um, we are ramping up some of our um, our resources on our new website, putting out blogs and interviewing people. We have a wonderful podcast um, that Jennifer hosts, and it comes out every single week. And a lot of people on all, you know, the whole gamut of topics. So definitely check out some of those information resources. And um, my job is to help hopefully connect us. I'm the community manager for this. So um, I, I would also like to look for more ways where it's easier for us to dialogue and, and to really truly network with one another. And um, I think over the next several months, we'll continue to develop that program. Um, but it's all because of you, because you guys have all the, all the knowledge and I just wanna be the, the, the magnet that connects everybody. Yeah, economic development um, is also really, I mean, it, it's all it's all connected, right? I mean, if you can't have a place to poop, you're not gonna have a place to live or do business. So we need all of this to work. <laughs> it's never simple. That's one of my favorite, uh, uh, favorite phrases at our house, nothing's ever simple. Um, it is great to meet you. I want you to have a wonderful weekend. Thank you so much. Let's all be safe. And let's all be sane. Take care of yourselves. The work is hard and long, but um, we can get through this together. Take care. Thank everybody. you so much, Pamela. Bye Have now. Have a great week, everybody.